Okay, this is part three of this little series on high yield corn and focusing on the fundamentals. In the previous recordings, we talked about high yields in general. We looked back at history uh, to see what's happened in the U.S. since 1866. And then I talked a little bit about the winners of the National Corn Yield Contest and what we could learn from them. And as it turns out, we can't learn much from them because we just don't see what we need to see in the printed winner's guides. And then in the last segment, I talked about the yield components that we do need to focus on. Plants per acre, ears per plant, kernels per ear, weight per kernel. And I talked about some of the stresses that could impact those yield components. And of course, that gives us some idea on what we can do to improve yields in the future. So we've sort of basically have come full circle. Uh, back to this question about higher yields and what can we do about it. And now we're at the point where I'm ready to share with you the secret of achieving higher yields in the future. I've thought about this for a long time and, and it took forever for me to come up with this answer. And then once I did, I realized it was so simple. And so here it is. The secret to achieving higher yields in the future is to figure out why you're not achieving high yields today. That sounds silly, right? And, and it is very simple, but what it's really talking about is identifying those yield limiting factors that are specific to your farming operation and diagnosing the causes and then taking steps to mitigate them, okay? This is what it comes down to for your farming operation. There are no set ways to do this. And if you fail to identify and diagnose your specific yield limiting factors, then some of the decisions you'll make are going to simply miss the mark. And you're going to either waste dollars on inputs that you simply don't need because you failed to identify the causes of the problems, or you're going to leave yield on the table by not using some inputs that you should have used if you had only done a better job of identifying the specific yield limiting factors. And understand this one simple fact of life. There are, are no silver bullets to what we do in growing a corn crop. There's no single solution. There's no one size fits all. It's all about searching for these yield limiting factors on your specific fields. And this is a season long mission that requires a lot of time and effort on your part and you just have to accept that fact that it takes a lot of hard work to identify what's holding back yields on your specific fields. All right, we talked about these yield components in the previous segment and how they're determined throughout the entire growing season and why we need to minimize stress during the entire growing season in order to optimize these different yield components. So. I want to talk about some of the tools in the toolbox that we have that are useful for helping us identify and diagnose these yield limiting factors. And one of them is as simple as the yield maps that you've been accumulating for years. And understand that these yield maps can be really useful roadmaps to simply tell us where the problem areas are in the field. And once we know where they are in the field, then that gives us some focus and it helps us be more efficient on this search for yield limiting factors. So when I look at a yield map like this, uh, I am really curious about these low yielding red areas. What can I learn about those areas? All right, I may be in, uh, also at the same time impressed by perhaps the 250 bushel yields I get in part of the field or maybe even higher than that but what I really want to find out is what's going on in these red areas and so using a yield map as a road map helps me be more efficient in the process especially if I have yield maps from multiple years and I'm trying to identify those problem areas that seem to appear every single time I have corn in that field. Now relate somewhat similar to yield maps is the access to aerial imagery that we have today uh, that we simply didn't have as easy of access to 20, 30 years ago. But aerial imagery during the season can also be used as roadmaps to simply tell us where the problem areas are in the field. And most of the time, aerial imagery taken during the season does mirror what we see at the end of the season in the yield map. And so again, it, it sort of tells us where these same problem areas are. 
And you might say, well, okay, I've already got yield maps. Why do I need aerial imagery? Well, the deal is, is that aerial imagery taken during the season tells you earlier when these problems are developing. And they, because they tell us earlier in the season where the problems are, it gives us an opportunity to visit the fields earlier in the season and do the crop diagnostics to determine the cause of the problem. And it's much more efficient doing it that way than waiting until harvest and seeing the low yielding areas coming up on the display on the yield monitor and then asking the question, what's going on? Because at that point in the season, quite often it's simply too late to do an accurate diagnostic as to why am I getting these low yields. So here's an example from one of our fields this past summer. Uh, this is a uh, image flown in late August and there are clearly areas in this field that are dead and dying. Um, it's not clear from the image that they're dying because of drought, but boots on the ground uh, confirm the fact and the weather records that these were areas of the field that were dying prematurely because of very severe drought stress. Now, yes, we can make that determination in August that the cause at that point in time was due to drought, but I had also done earlier flights on this field I'd spotted the same stunted areas earlier in the summer, in fact, beginning in mid-June. <clears throat> and at that point in time, uh, we'd actually had some pretty wet conditions, and those areas of the fields actually were beginning to suffer. Plants were beginning to be stunted. Roots were beginning to be injured, not because of drought, but because of damage caused by saturated soils and compaction because of the year after year of saturation and, and how that increases the risk of compaction due to tillage and field operations. So again, it was able to make me a slight, I was able to do a slightly different diagnostic uh, by flying that field early in the season and knowing there were problems developing than if I had waited till late in the season, seeing the same areas in the aerial image and then maybe determining wrongly that it was simply due to drought. <clears throat> Here's another example of a field where the drone imagery was showing us areas of the field with nitrogen deficiency. And so uh, uh, the first thing that I'll highlight are these areas at the beginning of the nitrogen applicator passes that are nitrogen deficient. And of course, these are the typical kind of things that we see when fertilizer flow is not yet at full flow as you begin an applicator pass. So it's not uncommon, in other words, to see these areas that are maybe 20, 30 feet long uh, that are nitrogen deficient. Uh, and the yield monitor might pick those up if they're big enough. You've got all 16 rows and it's 20 or 30 feet long. The yield monitor will probably pick those up. But the other thing in this photo that's maybe not as impressive visually, but nevertheless represents potential for lost yield, are these individual rows that are showing nitrogen deficient symptoms going throughout the entire length of these passes. And what this is indicating are areas where the outside row of the nitrogen applicator was simply not putting on as much nitrogen as the rest of the toolbar. And so the high resolution imagery of the drone was able to show us these individual rows with pretty dramatic nitrogen deficiency and in fact, when you actually look at those rows from the ground and compare the nitrogen deficiency symptoms to the beginning of the applicator passes, the severity of the nitrogen deficiency was almost as, uh, as much as it was at the beginning of the pass. So if you estimate the yield loss per acre based on just those rows, in other words, if you had a whole field with that level of nitrogen deficiency, you're probably looking at 50 to 75 bushel equivalent loss per acre. So it's nothing to sneeze at, but the problem is, is that because it's individual rows, the yield monitor and the yield map data will likely never detect that yield loss because those deficient rows will always be blended with the other rows that are, being, that are coming into the combine, okay? So again, one of the advantages of this high resolution drone imagery is we can spot problems that we might not be able to pick up with the yield monitor, and yet if we can spot them, identify them, determine the cause, and correct the situation, we're going to increase yields on that field. <clears throat> Here's another example of, of data. Uh, 
of tools in the toolbox. And, and this is an as-applied map of side dress nitrogen or side dress uh, UAN. And so sometimes, well, a lot of the, the precision ag technology we use generates as-applied data. We often get as-applied planting data, as-applied herbicide application data, as-applied side dress nitrogen data. We don't always take the time to look at them. In fact, maybe sometimes we don't even know that it's being collected. But understand that when we're looking for the causes of yield loss or lower yields in fields, sometimes it's equipment related. And so having access to the, such as applied data helps us pinpoint issues with equipment. So in this particular field, uh, there are areas that are showing different rates of side dress 28. Uh, and actually what I failed to tell you was uh, this was supposed to be a nitrogen trial, an on-farm nitrogen trial. So some of those rates that are showing the yellow and green application differences, they were meant to be. But in this northern area of the field are areas, here we go, let me go back, there. In the northern part of the field, there were areas of the field where clearly there were some issues going on with that nitrogen applicator. Now, for my sake as a researcher with this on-farm trial, these errors in the applicator uh, force us to abandon those reps of the treatments in that area of the field. All right, so it, it hurt our research from the farmer's perspective. You know, the farmer didn't necessarily care about what it did to our research, but the farmers losing yield in those areas of the field because those are pretty lengthy stretches of, of uh, applicator passes uh, where the applicator was simply failing to, to continue putting out the nitrogen. So again, having access to this kind of a, as applied data can help us do some of the diagnostics to determine what's causing low yield in areas of the field, especially when you look at the yield map and maybe it just doesn't make sense why it should be lower yield in that part of the field, but Using this as applied data can sometimes help us address that. <clears throat> so, among the tools in the toolbox, other tools in the toolbox are uh, simple tools like soil and plant tissue analyses. And so, if I go back to that yield map <clears throat> with the areas of, of low yielding red data in that field, I said it's going to help me focus my attention on those areas of low yields. And one of the first things I'm going to do to determine the cause of what's going on is to do some soil samples specifically in those low yielding areas and perhaps the next year that it's in corn going in and doing some targeted plant tissue sampling and using the results of those analyses to determine whether the problem is related to nutrient levels or perhaps soil pH and especially if I'm comparing samples taken from the problem areas with samples from the good areas. And, and you should always do that when you're doing this kind of targeted sampling is make sure that you're also sampling from the good areas so that you have something to compare to. Now in the tri-state region of Indiana, Ohio, and Michigan, we have our particular set of recommendations for these kinds of things. We call it the tri-state fertilizer recommendations. If you're outside of these three states, I'm sure you've got access to other recommendations that, that give you tables to help you interpret the results of soil sample tests and plant tissue sample tests. So be sure to use these tools in the toolbox as you're trying to determine the causes of some of the lower yield. So I'll, uh, now I want to talk about some common, <coughs> excuse me, yield limiting factors to consider. And I don't know who's watching this. I don't know where you're farming. I don't know what your situations are. So I, I can't tell you what your specific yield limiting factors are. Let me just share some of the common ones that I run into throughout much of Indiana and simply suggest that you consider these also as you're looking for yield limiting factors in your specific operations. <clears throat> One of the most common yield limiting factors in Indiana continues to be poorly drained soils. Yes, there's been a lot of tile work done over the decades. Yes, there is a certain amount of surface tile or surface drainage that's done. But nevertheless, there are still many, many acres in this state that continue to be poorly drained. And this creates all sorts of problems. Um, and if we can improve soil drainage by either tiling or by 
putting in surface drains. We can reduce the occurrence of ponding, the severity of ponding, the duration of the ponding or saturated soils. And that's going to certainly help roots develop the way they should. It's going to reduce the risk of plants being stunted from sitting in such saturated soil conditions. But improving soil drainage also reduces the risks of other problems. It reduces the risk of losing soil nitrate nitrogen due to denitrification that occurs in these saturated soils. And so over time, by improving the soil drainage, it may allow you to back off on your nitrogen fertilizer rates because you're losing less nitrogen due to denitrification. Improving soil drainage also reduces the risk of creating soil compaction from all sorts of field operations, from tillage to, to planters to combines to grain carts, you name it. If soils are poorly drained, there are fewer days where the soils are fit to be on in terms of soil moisture, it increases the odds of creating soil compaction. And so improving soil drainage will reduce that risk. If you do conventional tillage, then also uh, improving soil drainage will reduce the risk of creating cloddy seed beds in the spring because you're working the ground just a little bit on the wet side. And then on top of all this, improving soil drainage simply also reduces the risk of delayed field operations or interrupted field operations. And, and certainly the more working days we can regain by improved soil drainage and to improve the timeliness of all our field operations together, that's going to help increase yields in our fields. Another common yield limiting factor are hybrids and your ability to choose good hybrids. Today's hybrids all have pretty good yield potential. However, there's still variability among hybrids for that genetic yield potential. So certainly, as we go about the process of selecting hybrids, we want to identify hybrids that have good genetic yield potential. Now, just as importantly, for choosing hybrids is choosing hybrids with good stress tolerance. Often this is a genetic characteristic in, in terms of a host of different traits that enable it to be more tolerant to stress, but because weather and climate seem to be getting more variable and we seem to be getting more instances of severe extreme weather, we need hybrids that can tolerate a wide range of growing conditions. This picture that you're looking at shows an example of two hybrids and the differences in their ability to tolerate cold, wet, crusty, and otherwise crappy conditions after planting. One hybrid was able to tolerate all that stress much better than the others and the aerial image taken that year clearly shows the difference between these hybrids and as it turns out the hybrid whose strips you see that are so thin uh, the farmer ultimately replanted most of that hybrid. The strips that are much darker green, more plant material, uh, very few uh, of those strips had any replanting done. So again, genetic yield potential is one consideration for hybrids, but as we try to figure out how to uh, grow a crop and make it resilient to stress, we need to look at how it can tolerate these stress conditions. And the best way to address that is to see how it performs in a wide range of variety trials and look for hybrids that do pretty well in most trials. And again, I, I just can't overemphasize to not underestimate the importance of this seemingly simple decision. Genetic vari er, g differences in genetic yield potential among hybrids are easily worth 20 to 30 bushel. Even with all of today's good hybrids, there's still an opportunity for a 20 to 30 bushel swing simply due to genetic yield potential. I've already talked about, reinforced the fact of, of this need to pay attention to hybrid characteristics for stress tolerance. And the best way to do that is to look for hybrids that consistently yield well in variety trials across many locations. And that's sort of the key thing because if you look at the results of trials from many locations, hopefully that also represents a range of growing conditions. And then if you can find hybrids that yield pretty darn good most of the time in this, all of these trial locations, 
you're probably looking at hybrids that will do pretty well for you next year in, in a year where you don't know what's going to happen in terms of weather. Another common yield limiting factor that I've already alluded to is simply soil compaction from tillage or repeated heavy equipment traffic across the field. This picture is showing two, essentially two instances of soil compaction. Uh, there are uh, the more noticeable tire tracks going through the field that represent the sprayer tracks going across the field and creating compaction from the tire traffic. A little less noticeable, if you squint your eyes, you can see other pairs of tracks going across the field and those represent the dual tires on the tillage tractor working the ground a little bit wet in the spring. All right. You add this up over the entire field, there's a lot of acres of compacted tire tracks and that's going to take a toll on yield. All right. So to the extent that we can alleviate soil compaction, uh, we're going to improve yields or at least be able to grow good yielding corn more consistently. And the risk of soil compaction goes hand in hand with poor soil drainage and our use of large and heavy field equipment. Compaction makes poor drainage even poorer and it makes saturated soils stay saturated longer. So it exacerbates that whole situation when you have compaction on top of soils that are naturally poorly drained. Soils are most vulnerable to compaction when the soil moisture is near field capacity. Now understand that in practice, when a field's at field capacity and you're out there digging around and working it in your, it doesn't feel that bad. And, and you're more likely than not to say, well, let's go ahead and hit the field. But ironically, that tends to be the day when it's the most easily compacted. And of course, compaction limits the ability of that crop to root deeply. And subsequently, it limits that crop's resilience to drought stress that occurs later in the summer. Anytime that we get a mid to late summer drought set in, the fields that show the effects of the drought stress first typically are the fields that have a lot of soil compaction, right? So it simply makes the crop less resilient to midsummer drought stress. <clears throat> and then finally, just to list a few other common yield limiting factors, but you know, a lot of us are having to deal with the increasing resistance of weeds to a wide range of herbicides. And this problem is not going away. In fact, it's getting worse and will probably continue to get worse. And it's a huge problem. Now, I'm not a weed scientist, and I won't go into great detail on how you handle weeds that are resistant to herbicides. I'd simply tell you, make sure you seek out the experts on weed control and look for the recommendations they have on how, first of all, how to diagnose weed resistance to herbicides, and then secondly, how to handle such weeds in the program, because uh, it's just becoming a, a greater and greater problem that is, is unfortunately not going to go away. Foliar diseases for many of us in the more humid areas of the corn growing areas are, are a perennial problem. And so for many of us, we deal with gray leaf spot or northern corn leaf blight or tar spot increasingly in the northern parts of the corn belt. Make sure, among other things, as you're selecting hybrids. Well, first of all, make sure you know what foliar diseases your fields typically have. All right. Once you know what are your worst or most likely occurring diseases, then make sure as you're selecting hybrids to look for genetic resistance to those diseases because that will go a long ways to avoiding the need for fungicide later on. But keep in mind we do have foliar fungicides in the toolbox and so if hybrid resistance can't do it for you and you still get some pretty severe risk of these diseases developing then make good use, make smart use of foliar fungicides to help control these. Because remember, the importance of keeping this crop healthy during the latter half of grain fill is so important for achieving maximum kernel weight. And of course, nutrient deficiencies and low soil pH, you know, these are problems that we've worried about forever and you need to continue making a determination whether you are dealing with situations of nutrient deficiencies and low soil pH and taking the steps to correct them. And so in summary, I'll just simply say that in order to increase corn yields, we need to focus on the fundamentals. And this involves 
continually improving our agronomic knowledge, making sure that we're watching videos like this, that we're going to conferences and listening to experts, not just from our area, but from around the, the different areas of the country. Secondly, we need to identify the yield limiting factors that are important for our specific fields. We need to locate them in the fields. We need to quantify the areas in the field, quantify the yield loss we're getting, and most importantly, diagnose why they're there to diagnose the cause. And once we have that information, then we can make some sound agronomic decisions based on facts and data. And if we focus on these fundamentals, I'm confident that we can continue to increase yields and maybe when the third miracle of yield improvement does occur, we'll be in even better shape to uh, take advantage of it. So with that, thank you for watching these uh, three segments of this presentation. Um, my email address is on this slide. My Twitter handle is there, as is the address for my Chat and Chew Cafe website, where you can get a lot more information on corn production from around much of the country. So with that, again, thank you for watching, and have a good day.